more students here than in one of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, firstly, I'd like to reassure everyone that no mathematics have been harmed in the writing of this paper. Um, my understanding of quantum physics, chaos theory, um, relativity, um, relativity and um, other things is more philosophical than mathematical. Um, but one, another thing was, while this symposium is underpinned by the topic of evolution, the evolution of story, after seeing the latest Star Wars movie in December, I was more concerned about the devolution of story, or maybe the degradation or the end of story as we know it. Um, and I kind of feel the same way about other things that we've got in popular culture, like Star, War, uh, Star Trek Discovery. Um, it has fantastic production values. Um, it has the, the sparkle and spectacle of blockbuster entertainment. But they just don't pay attention to logical, sensible narrative storytelling. So for these two leviathans of popular culture, story is no longer the king, but more like a kitchen hand or a court jester. And, but on the other hand, many scholars have argued that story has grown exponentially in complexity in recent years, in temporal mischief, in stories that make excessive cognitive demands on viewers and readers, on all of us. So we have Jason Mattel's complex storytelling and Paul Booth's idea of temporally fractured narratives. Helen Powell talks about story being replaced by stories, the plurality of stories, puzzles and fractured timelines, where we kind of have to do a lot of work to understand what's going on. And Melissa Ames is focused on time retardation and compression <coughs> and chronological disruption, again, all about time being a bit weird and a bit non-linear and a bit chaotic. And Warren Buckley talks about puzzle films. Again, we have to do the work. We have to solve the puzzle. And David Herman talks about time loop quests in 2010. But I think rather than quote from academics, we can quote from the great British time lord, Doctor Who, who said that people assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect. But actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly, wobbly, tiny, whiny stuff. And that's what we're talking about with these things that play with time is tiny, whiny, wibbly, wobbly stuff. But I wonder if these things are new at all. These shifts are often seen as symptomatic of our digital age, of new media technologies that radically puncture our understanding and experiences of linear time. But it goes back much further than that. But in new media technology terms, think about the way in which we navigate through Windows on Twitter, on um, different social media platforms, and we're clicking and going through different modes of time, if you like. And Paul Booth argues that that's changed the way in which we understand the world. But even earlier than that, Jim Collins argued in the early 90s that the surge in information technologies then, um, so things like satellite TV, home computers, um, the internet eventually, had produced an ever-increasing surplus of texts where we, we had access to more things, more media than ever before. Whereas when I was young, we used to go to the video store and it was possible to watch everything in the store or just get out Rocky Three again for the 55th time. That changed with the coming of Blockbuster and then, I mean, nowadays, it's there's so much media. I'm sure I'm the same as many people where I have a to-watch pile that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and a to-read pile and it's sometimes it's more stressful than what it used to be like. Jim Collins argues that we have all these texts now which is giving birth to the sophisticated media literate consumer. So we're all experts now in narrative, apparently. So we all have what Umberto Eco calls substantial intertextual dictionaries all in our head. We've seen so many things, we've watched so much stuff, that we're all kind of amateur narratologists ourselves. We all have these vast cognitive libraries living in our heads. And for Collins, he called this um, a new hyper-consciousness. So it seems that story has evolved in some way, or maybe audiences have evolved rather than story. But how true is this? So in seminars um, a few weeks ago with undergraduates, um, many students complained that they couldn't understand the matrix. And they also said that they couldn't understand Tarantino's Pulp Fiction because it was too much work. So I think when we have these bold claims about hyper-consciousness and everyone is an expert, 
is not quite true. And I'm not trying to dismiss um, my, my undergraduate students. Many of them are creative and brilliant. Um, but it's these bold claims about everyone are, is something that has always troubled me. Um, so in 2017, I published a, a, a chapter in a book called Make Hours Marvel, which was about the Marvel transmedia universe, from comics to film, television, etc. And I kind of played a game where I used quantum physics to construct a framework in order to understand the Marvel multiverse as a transmedia entity. Um, the, the article, uh, sorry, the chapter was called um, Schrodinger's Cape, the quantum seriality of the Marvel multiverse. <coughs> so it was a game comprising parallel worlds, alternate realities, different iterations of characters, cats alive or dead, or alive and dead simultaneously. And I also wrote a chapter on the Stephen King multiverse for a book that Matt Freeman and I, who's here as well, um, did a book called Global Convergence Cultures about transmedia across the world rather than just in Anglo-American contexts. So I've been considering the intersection between quantum physics and narrative for, for quite some time, but it comes and goes, winking out of my inner space with every lecture, seminar, student, and research project. But recently it's been reawakened once again in my thinking, in part thanks to Roy for um, speaking to me about and, and inviting me to the conference, and an author called John Higgs, he's a popular author, who wrote a book called Stranger Than We Can Imagine, Making Sense of the 20th Century, and another book called The KLF, Chaos Magic, and The Band Who Burned a Million Quid. So reading both of Higgs's books in a two-day gulp was like ingesting the literary equivalent of psychedelics. Um, it was a magic mushroom of countercultural ideas and offbeat philosophies, things like chaos magic, discordianism, Dadaism, the realm of idea space. Um, I think we'll begin with Higgs and see where that takes us. So Higgs argues that the territory of the 20th century includes dark patches of thick, deep woods. The established paths tend to skirt around these areas, visiting briefly but quickly scurrying on, as if fearful of becoming entangled. These are areas such as relativity, cubism, the Somme, quantum mechanics, the id, existentialism, Stalin, psychedelics, chaos mathematics, and climate change. <coughs> They have a reputation for initially appearing difficult and becoming increasingly bewildering the more they are studied. The final challenge is to somehow make it through the swamp of postmodernism. It is not, if we are honest, an appealing journey. Very few of the adventurers who tackle the 20th century make it through postmodernism and out the other side. Which is true of many academics because postmodernism can wrap you in such a conceptual not that it's difficult, if meaning is, is everywhere and doesn't mean anything, then how can we talk about it anymore? So things like postmodernism, post-structuralism, quantum physics, and chaos mathematics all seem to brush up against a thousand dialogic threads, as Will Brooker has argued. Although at first glance, they certainly seem to make for odd bedfellows. This is not to suggest that these entanglements have been deliberate or conscious, however, but more accidental, more coincidental, a profound collision of synchronicities rather than concrete associations, as Higgs emphasizes. Einstein and the modernists appear to have separately made the same leap at the same time. They not only recognize that we are bound by relative perspectives, but they have found a higher framework such as space-time or cubism, in which the subjectivity of a single perspective could be overcome. In 1878, Nietzsche wrote that there are no eternal facts as there are no eternal truths. Einstein and Picasso were offering their own solutions to Nietzsche's complaint. So for Higgs, in his books, he's talking, about, especially in the, the 20th century book, he's talking about how things radically have changed over the last 100 years that we just don't understand where we come from and that if we track it through the normal narratives, where we are today doesn't make any sense. So the 20th century tapped into the shock of the new over and over again. If you think about the beginning of the 20th century, even the 1950s, television's just been introduced. The idea of the internet would blow their minds if we could jump into a time machine and go back and tell them how we are existing today. 
So these kind of these events frequently destroyed um, frames of reference, just as Einstein's theories of relativity did with understandings of time. Remember, time is wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. It's not this straightforward. Well, it is for us. We're born, we progress, we die. A bit dark, but never mind. That's the way it is. But so uh, Einstein's um, theories were, were kind of in quantum physics were saying at the subatomic level, time is not chronological at all. An atom can appear at different parts of the universe at once and at different moments in time. Which, I mean, if you think about that, it's just enough to drive you mad. So the giants of modernism, such as James Joyce, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, and just very few examples, each produce remarkable works of literary experimentation. And so Joyce's Ulysses, Pound's The Cantos, and Eliot's The Wasteland rejected the singular narrative framework of classic fiction. We might be used to this flipping forward through time and all of that these days, but, at the, but in the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, these were relatively new ideas and radical. So in the wasteland, Eliot moved away from the expected touchstones of a consistent narrative. He could jump through a succession of different scenes taken from a range of different cultures and time periods and focus on moments which thematically echoed each other. Readers were thus expected to enter a state of intense concentration in order to grasp the story. That is, if story was present at all. And I'm thinking about the many attempts I've had at reading Joyce's Finnegan's Wake or Pinchon's Gravity's Rainbow. I've tried many times because I think I should have read these books as an academic. But story, to me, is what's most important of all. Story should be king. But if we fast forward in time, we come to Hugh Everett III's Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Physics, a model that proposed that there is no such thing as a singular universe, but a plurality of universes, of alternate worlds that are created continuously by the different choices and the different paths that we take. For those of us who fondly remember the 80s, and I recognize that that might be only a few tiny portion of this audience. And um, maybe you've all heard the song by George Michael called A Different Corner. And he sings, he sings, turn a different corner, and we never would have met. <coughs> what Everett proposed was George would have met his romantic counterpart, even if he had turned a different corner. The universe would bifurcate into two paths. You might have seen this in a film with Gwyneth Paltrow called Flight and Doors. So in these two paths, George bumps into his future paramour and another where he turned a different corner and they never met, but they both exist in the multiverse. <coughs> Somewhere across the multiverse, George Michael still lives on, still makes music, still meets new people. Somewhere across the multiverse, Wham never split up. I'm sure everyone knows what Wham is, but if you, who Wham are, but please, <laughs> if you don't. Um, and Andrew Ridgely wouldn't become a footnote in music history. Somewhere across the multiverse, in fact, I have tickets to see George Michael tonight at the Southampton Auto. <laughs> but the term multiverse has gained cultural traction over the past two decades or so in popular culture, used for all manner of topics and purposes, both in science and in culture, kind of interweaving. Personally, I think this is due to the amount of popular books that started to come out in the early 90s on quantum physics, for the Waterstones crowd, so you can go up now, quantum physics and the multiverse can be explained. Well, they're safe for lay people, but even, even those are tough, really tough. But what strikes me as fascinating is the way in which Everett's many worlds paradigm was expla explained firstly in literature. Perhaps the most exam famous example being Jorge Luis Borges' story, The Garden of Forking Paths, first published in 1941. This is 15 years before Everett's model was published. At the time, Everett's model was completely dismissed by the academic community, by the scientific community. It wasn't taken seriously at all. And let's have a look at Borges. So that's Borges at the bottom with all these fork and paths. So this is, this is the multiverse. This is before quantum physics. He believed in an infinite series of time, in a growing dizzying network of divergent, convergent, and parallel times. 
This network of times would approach one another, forked, broke off, or, one aware of, or were unaware of one another for centuries, embraces all possibilities of time. We do not exist in the majority of these times. In some, you exist and not I. In others, I and not you. In others, both of us. Time forks perpetually towards innumerable futures. In many ways, Borges was talking about our contemporary popular culture and the media objects which we have access to, especially through things like streaming technologies and illegal downloads. In programming the universe, physicist Seth Lloyd recounted a conversation he had with Borges, and he asked Borges if he'd been influenced by quantum theory at all. I mean, obviously he couldn't be influenced by something that didn't exist unless he had a, um, his own DeLorean that he could um, fire up to 88 miles an hour, I guess. <coughs> Borges responded and said he was not surprised that culture and science intermingled. After all, physicists were readers too. And Andrew Crumley has observed similar. Physicists are not only readers, but a part of history as well. And the multiverse has a history far older than that of quantum theory, cropping up in philosophy and literature since ancient times. Earlier still, we have H.G. Wells in a novel called Men Like Gods from 1922. And he's talking about two-dimensional universes lying side by side, like sheets of paper in three-dimensional space. So in the many dimensional spaces about which the ill-equipped human mind is still slowly and painfully acquiring knowledge, it is possible for an innumerable quantity of practically three-dimensional universes to lie, as it were, side by side and to undergo roughly parallel movement through time. As Brake and Hook argue in their book, Different Engines, How Science Fiction, sorry, How Science Drives Fiction and Fiction Drives Science, science has actually been particularly slow at catching up with fiction. It was science fiction fantasy author Michael Moorcock that first employed the term multiverse to refer to parallel worlds in his novel, The Sundered Worlds. <coughs> I mean, there's lengthy passages in the book where it explains it, but basically it's the, multiverse of, uh, it's, it's the multiverse containing many levels, and that their universe was but one level, a fragment of the great whole, and this multiverse is kind of levels and levels to infinity. But it's interesting that the term itself, multiverse, as it's used in science, came 40 years later in a 1990 new, uh, new scientist article on wormholes. Um, and it said this, the wormhole picture changes our view of the origin of the universe in a big bang, which is now seen as the event corresponding to our universe, branching off from the greater multiverse, to which we must still be connected by an umbilical wormhole. And even, even more so, in 1953, Wonder Woman, the female superhero who I'm sure all of our young students are, familiar with because of the film. Wonder Woman entered a multiverse, one which would become a key characteristic of the publisher's fictional world from 1961 onwards. And we can see here, it's twin worlds rather than infinite. And Wonder Woman's saying that Earth must have a twin world existing simultaneously alongside it, but developing differently. And everyone on it is a double of everyone on Earth. This is repeated throughout science fiction and popular culture, this idea of doubling. Star Trek famously had the mirror universe where Captain Kirk and crew were villains in the other world. In 1961, DC Comics introduced this idea in um, the Flash number 123. This was called the Flash of Two Worlds. So for people not, not familiar with superhero comics, this guy on your left is Barry Allen. This guy on your right is Jay Garrick. This is the Golden Age Flash. This is the Silver Age Flash. This guy had disappeared, gone. This was a reboot. This was a time when they had met together, and it was rationalized by the fact that they belong, uh, belonged on different Earths. And this has become a key part of DC Comics and Marvel ever since, um, featuring many event series every summer. For maybe 20 years, big sales, um, big sales drive for DC Comics where Characters on Earth 1 and Earth 2 would meet each other, then other Earths were introduced, like Earth 3, Earth 4, Earth X, with where the Nazis won the war, and on and on and on. And then in the 80s, we had Crisis on Infinite Earths, where the whole multiverse is destroyed, 
And this just, I mean, it's back now, of course, because, <laughs> because they need to make money. And in recent, I mean, this is a very, very truncated history, um, but in recent years, and I'd say maybe this is 2017, the multiverse has an upside down, which is the dark multiverse, and then you have all these versions of Batman coming forward, very quantum. And now they've got maps and all these different, there's only 52 worlds in the DC universe at the moment. In Marvel it's infinite, but it's not really infinite. How can it be infinite? This is confusing and don't worry. It's very confusing if one of them is not what um, Douglas Walt has called a super reader. Readers familiar enough with enormous numbers of old comics that they understand what's really being discussed in the story. And I'm talking about superheroes here for a reason. I mean, superheroes are a big part of our contemporary landscape. And many of the models that were pioneered in the 60s is something that's been introduced now. So you've seen um, multiverses in TV on Arrow and Crisis on Infinite Earths has been adapted a few weeks ago. We have the Marvel Cinematic Universe and I've heard people saying how confusing it is because there's 22 films. It's a tiny, tiny portion compared to what this is. As Walk says, picking up a superhero comic right now, if you're not already immersed in that world, is likely to make you feel sim simultaneously talked down to and baffled by the endless references to stuff you're already supposed to know. Contemporary superhero comics aren't meant to be read as freestanding works, even on those rare occasions when their plots are self-contained. Each company's superhero comics are collective histories <coughs> of a fictional place that now has so much backstory attached to it that no one person knows it all. So the concept of the multiverse, as we understand it today, I would argue, is pi was pioneered by DC Comics well before Marvel did. And of course, superhero comics are not really acknowledged for, for much because they're seen as ephemeral and, and not important. I'm not aware of any mode of storytelling, and I might be wrong, uh, uh, someone could tell me, popular or otherwise, that has so many alternative versions of keystone characters coexisting within a narrative multiverse. So here's an example of Batman as a vampire in Red Rain, Batman in the American Civil War, Batman in the French Revolution, in World War II, teaming up with Harry Houdini, teaming up with Edgar Allan Poe, fighting Jack the Ripper, um, as a mashup with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as a king in Arthur's Camelot, in a world fused with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu, helping Elliot Ness fight Al Capone in um, Prohibition America, in an adaptation of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde called Two-Face. This is a tiny, tiny portion of the multiverse of superhero comics. The list is quite frankly endless. So all this talk of complex narrativity in the 21st century pales in comparison with superhero comics from the 1960s onwards which Ross Kavanagh has described, superhero comics as the largest narrative constructions in human history, exceeding, for example, the vast body of myth, legend, and story that underlies Greek and Latin literature. Indeed, one of the principal reasons that superhero comics have been struggling for survival since at least the 1970s is due to this size, scope, and complexity. So Bart Beatley explains that superhero titles regularly sold millions um, in the 1940s, many of hundreds of thousands of copies as late as the 1950s. Yet their economic decline has been precipitous over the course of the past few, de few decades. So it might be, we might say that superhero comics are popular culture. They're not really. They're a very fringe cult medium of maybe 100,000 readers. Well, sorry, the top selling title sells about 100,000 copies a month. Compared with the millions that they used to sell, this is very fringe. And I think it's probably surprising the only reason it continues to exist is because of the films that generate billions. So Bartley explains that the in ever-increasing complexification of superhero storytelling has narrowed the audience to only the most committed readers. Given the vastness of this narrative, it's perhaps unsurprising for publishers to discover that the extensive backstories of their characters are off-putting to new entrants in the field. This is one of the reasons why DC have repeatedly rebooted their universe to attract new readers. It never works, though, because within a few months, you're back to the same situation with so much continuity and backstory. Superhero comics are, according to Duncan and Smith, 
Never-ending, intricately linking, periodically reconstructed stories constitute a unique form of narrativity. Now, if we, if we talk about um, the contemporary story, like Jason Mattel, Albert Garcia has argued that the past 15 years or so has witnessed a remarkable revolution of narrative complexity in television. One that is unequal in mass culture, he argues. But then, he undermines his own statement by <coughs> saying that the shift enables the medium to delve into narratological territories that had previously only been explored in comics and graphic novels. But both the big two superhero publishers, DC and Marvel, are exemplars of what I term quantum storytelling. Vast narrative networks comprised of multiple imaginary subworlds that operate as a multiverse characterized by not linearity, but translinearity. The idea that, well, let's just say tiny, whiny, wibbly, wobbly. Many, many different versions of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, etc. But what strikes me about all this with regards to quantum storytelling is how this history has largely been ignored by academic studies, um, especially in literary studies. So um, we, have, we do have books that have used science to look at narratives. So we have Quirks of the Quantum by Samuel Chase Cole. Fiction in the Quantum Universe, a, very much a pioneering text from the 90s by Susan Stroll. And Chaos Bound and Chaos and Order, one edited by Catherine Hales and one's written by her, which is about looking at quantum mechanics and kind of saying, what can we learn from this in relation to literature? But this is all of the <coughs> texts in these books that are under analysis of canonical <coughs> literature. It's your Joyce's, your, your T.S. Eliot's. Um, Thomas Pynchon, postmodernists, that type of thing. And it's high time that forms of, pop forms of popular culture are given their due for their influence. The narrative complexity of our contemporary television series and film franchises often mobilize frameworks that have been used and abused, iterated and reiterated in superhero <coughs> comics for well over 50 years at this point, perhaps even longer. That being said, it's worth considering that audiences today are primed to expect complexity. Some audiences. I mean, my mom still likes watching Coronation Street and CSI. So it's not, it, maybe it's not as simple as that. Things are rarely that simple, obviously. So whether it be TV series like Lost or Fringe, both of which are kind of quantum storytelling, or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which, which is really a transmedia universe considering the streaming programs, etc. All of these can be understood as contemporary examples of quantum storytelling. Temporally complex narratives that puncture models of linear time, that fracture the unidirectional arrow of time of Newtonian physics, and that include multiple imaginary worlds as part of a broader multiverse. But it's not only superhero comics or TV shows that involve multiverses. Children are also being primed to understand. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have had episodes where old iterations clash with the new ones. Transformers has a multiverse. Sonic has a multiverse, would you believe? And Garfield's pet horse. <laughs> and He-Man now um, is it's Masters of the Multiverse rather than Masters of the Universe. And this is a map done by a fan online of the Transformers multiverse. And I mean, that's, that's really complicated. And <laughs> a lot of fans are taking it upon themselves to kind of do this kind of indexing online to, to write catalogs and wikis. And, and to be honest, when it comes to looking at popular culture, whenever I talk to fans at conferences, at conventions normally, they are much more expert in these things than any academic that I've ever met because they live this stuff. So, just to, just to finish off, the story seems to evolve by looking backwards. I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard this term transmedia storytelling. And there's been a lot of academics saying, hey, this is a new thing. It's a new buzzword, then a new thing. And, and I'll point to Matthew Freeman again, um, my good friend <coughs> and academic from the front row, who wrote a book um, on transmedia storytelling and showed that, well, it was a PhD as well, right, Matt? Which showed that, hey, if we look at the beginning of the 20th <coughs> century, he is transmedia storytelling. Might not have been called that, but it existed. So I'm always suspicious of ideas of, new types of story, unless of course the avant-garde um, stories that are not stories. So um, Abbott argues that um, 
temporally messy narratives are simply a new twist on an old narrative condition. And nonlinearity has been common in narrative discourse from the earliest instances of storytelling. David Bordwell has challenged ac academic argument pertaining to complex storytelling as contemporary drivers, claiming that most examples could easily be applied to the classic Hollywood period. So things like Citizen Kane and How Green w w Was My Valley, um, these were flashback movies. The Locket had flashbacks within flashbacks. And The Killers and All About Eve had multi-narrational multi modes within the films. Bordwell argues that, sorry, um, Chris Dizalo echoes Bordwell's perspective arguing that the contemporary <coughs> configuration of complex storytelling is prefigured by a historical phenomenon with a long genealogy in both literature and film. And Bordwell argues that sooner or later, everything hangs together by causal coherence. So even a film like Pulp Fiction, which I mentioned earlier, yes, it's all temporally messy, but we only understand the story once we rearrange the pieces into the right order. Story is by its definition linear. That's not to say that it's always presented lin in linear ways. So in quantum physics, the relationship between the observer and the observed is foundational. So what they found out was light behaves as a wave until we observe it, and then it behaves as a particle. Well, that's just mental, isn't it? It's, it's kind of like that, that, that old ad ad adage that I'm sure everyone's heard. If a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? Well, of course it does, but I can't prove it. Because as soon as I do, then I've observed it, haven't I? So there's no way around it. It's kind of a, a, th a tricky thought experiment. And, in, um, and Schrodinger's cat uh, postulates that a cat in a box, curtains over the door, with a vial of poison inside that may or may not murder poor kitty, <laughs> would be both alive and dead until someone takes a look and collapse the wave function, as they call it in quantum physics. <laughs> Everett's many worlds theory, however, pr proposed this idea of the quantum superposition. So that means that peeling back the curtain to check on the cat's health would not collapse into an either or dead or alive situation, but that the cat would always be dead and alive in different universes. So by peeling back and observing, we bifurcate those branches. So narratives fight like Schrodinger's cat. We each interpret texts in manifold ways. So if we ask audiences what a text means, we will be confronted by a potential infinitude of interpretations, some of which share patterns, some of which might be radically different, none of which should be deemed as completely right or wrong. The cat is both alive and dead until it is observed by an observer. Text can mean many contradictory things all at the same time, in, in my research on Star Wars, I found fans arguing that Star Wars is reactionary and racist, and the one saying it's progressive and um, almost Marxist. So I'm not trying to say, argue one's right or the other, but if you can, and Game of Thrones is another example. I've read many, many articles about people arguing that it's either feminist or anti-feminist. Well, can it be both? Well, I would say yes. Culture is paradoxical, meaning is transitory. It's always on the move. It's caught between life and death, just like Schrodinger's cat, until they're observed by an observer, or in story terms, interpreted by an interpreter. All story <coughs> is quantum, and so is all our culture. Thank you. <coughs>